Hi everybody, Gary Simmons here for the Game Institute and welcome back to Lesson 59 in the Dead Earth Game Development Series. Although I say this is Lesson 59, it's also really Lesson 1 in what is officially Part 2 of the Dead Earth Game Development Series. Now in Part 1, our attention was almost exclusively on the AI of our zombies. Uh, in this section of the course, though, we're going to put the AI and the zombies to one side, because I think we're all a bit zombied out at the moment. And we're going to work on building our interactive world. Now we did a little bit with the interaction system at the end of Part 1, when we were developing our Creeper minigame. But in this section of the course, we're going to take that a lot further, because the interactive system in Dead Earth is really the foundation of everything else that follows. On top of the interactive system, we build the collectible object system, which is objects that can not only be activated, but also picked up and added to your inventory. And then on top of the collectible object system, we also have the specialized collectible objects, such as weapons. And uh, once we've done all that, we'll be ready to put in our FPS arm system. But we've still got quite a long way to go. And in this lesson, we're going to be working on the door system. Now, it seems pretty simple, right, to open a door. I mean, you just rotate it around its up vector, it opens, and all is well. Well, making a robust and flexible door system, such as the one that we need in Dead Earth, is not as simple as it first might seem. In fact, when I wrote the script to this to test that it worked, it was around about 550 to 600 lines of code. So in a minute, we'll talk a little bit about what on earth could make a door system so complex when it seems a pretty simple task. But for now, let me just introduce you to the new project. If you are following along with this lesson, you need to make sure that you have this project downloaded first that you see on the screen in front of me. Um, you can download this from the resources area on the Game Institute website. It will be called something like Lesson 59 pre-lesson project. It's for Unity 2018.3. That's important. That is the precise version of Unity you need to run this project. The reason I say that is if you're following along in real time, just before Christmas 2018, we released a version of this project for you to become familiar with. It was for 2018.2, and the first thing everybody did when they downloaded it was loaded it into 2018.3, and it wasn't compatible. It broke, um, and that was because there is a, a slight bug in the version 1 post processing stack, the one that's on Unity's asset store, and it causes a name space conflict in 2018.3. It's easy to resolve, but we decided as you guys were going to load it into 2018.3 anyway, well then we would essentially discard that upload. I would upgrade the project to 2018.3, and that is the version of Unity that we're going to work with for the next section of this course. Now, before I start reviewing the project, I am going to say something, and I'm going to say it in as stern a voice as I can, in really just a vain attempt to try and get you guys to listen to me. Please do use the version of Unity that I am using in the lesson. It doesn't matter if you're following along two years from now and you want to do it in Unity 2020.3, don't do it. Download the version that I'm using. And over time, we're going to make sure that we keep upgrading this project so you don't have to worry about the fact that if you're just joining now that you're going to get the final game and source code in some old version of Unity. But for learning purposes, you want to be following along with the version that I'm using. Otherwise, if something doesn't work or you're getting different results to me, you will not know whether it is something you have misunderstood in the video or that you've done everything right but guess what that no longer works in the current version of unity you gain nothing you just make your life entirely miserable by not following along in the same version of unity as me like i said we will keep the projects up to date you don't have to worry about a project being left in some old defunct version of unity that's not going to happen are we clear on this oh god i hope so also if you've got questions on the forum um, and something is isn't working right for you do me a favor first thing you do when you ask the question tell me what version of unity you're using because i just want a sanity check to make sure that you're using the version of unity that i've suggested okay my lecture is over let's now examine the project okay so while this project might on first appearance look very different to the one that we ended up with at the end of our creeper minigame it's still exactly the same project all I did was I imported all of the hospital models, props, and geometry into the Creeper project, and then I deleted all of the Creeper stuff. Now, when I say all of the Creeper stuff, of course, I don't mean all of our prefab zombies and our audio managers and all of our scripts and our animation controllers. They are all intact, as is our FPS controller. In fact, I prefabbed all of those things so that I could easily drag them into other scenes. 
And then what I did was I deleted all of the creeper scenes and all of the creeper geometry. Because remember, in Creeper, we were just using that demonstration scene that uh, Unity Technologies had provided us. So uh, I got rid of all that. So now the project is a little bit smaller because of it. And uh, that's a good thing because it's becoming quite big now with all of the new stuff that we've bought in. And what you see in the scene view now is about a third of the size of what our first level hospital will be in Dead Earth. I've only at the moment textured and populated about a third of the hospital, but the, the actual hospital is going to be three times bigger than this once I connect all the parts together. I'm still in the process of doing that, but there's more than enough hospital to go on with at the moment for us to uh, implement many of the systems that we have to implement. And then a little bit further down the line, perhaps in line maybe with uh, another big Unity update, we'll put another version of the project up so that you can download it uh, in that newer version and with the complete hospital level. So if we look in the assets folder, you can see that if we drill down into our Dead Earth folder, we still have all of those folders that we had before. So if we go into our prefabs folder, for example, you can see that our, uh, our zombies are still all intact. We haven't lost any of those, so uh, we can drag those into the scene. But at the moment, this hospital hasn't got any nav mesh baked for it. And that's something I did because in this next section, I don't want to talk about zombies. I don't want to see zombies. I'm a bit zombied out. So I'm just going to be working on the interactive environment. And a little further down the line, when we're ready to put the zombies back in, uh, we'll make sure that they're the right scale. Then we'll bake a nav mesh. And then we'll start thinking about which things need to be nav obstacles, things like doors and stuff like that. But at the moment, I just don't want to even look at zombies for a while. We've done 58 lessons with zombies. I'm done. Uh, but what you will see in our prefabs folder now is we now have a hospital folder. And in the hospital folder, you can see we have things like doors, which are the doors that are used by the level. And we're going to be working with these prefabs in this lesson. And we're going to start adding scripts to them. Also notice that because I'm in 2018.3, this now uses the new prefab system. So you'll see when I select a prefab, we no longer see all the details of the prefab in the inspector. But instead, we have to click the open prefab button like so, and it kind of opens up the prefab in its own sort of mini scene where we can then edit it much as we did before. And that's because prefabs are now assets. And you can just step back into the scenes view again by clicking the scenes button from the prefab window and that'll take you back. Another way that you can get into the prefab is by selecting any object in the scene, such as say our audio manager and clicking on the little right arrow there and that'll take you in to examine the prefab as well. And the prefab system is greatly improved in Unity 20. 28.3, which is another reason actually why I decided to uh, take the plunge and upgrade it to 2018.3, because we're going to be working with a lot of prefabs and making lots of alterations to prefabs. And in the old version of Unity, if you broke the connection between a prefab and its instance, it could be a real nightmare, whereas you can't even do that now in Unity 2018.3. Instances of prefabs are always connected to uh, their original prefab, but they just store a series of modifications, which you can very easily wind back and undo. Uh, if we look back in the prefabs folder again, you can see we have another folder called Gary's Signs and Wall Decorations. So there we have a little chain. I like this chain, actually. I just made it out of uh, two billboards, crisscrossed them, um, because obviously modeling a real chain would take an awful lot of polygons if you uh, wanted to do it as a 3D object. So uh, this works very similar to how grass works with the train system. We just crisscross some billboards together. And I use this to hang some of the hospital signs. See if I go down into, uh, I don't know, let's see here. There you go. You can see. There they are, my chains. And they look really uh, convincing. Uh, so if we go into uh, the departments folder, you can see we have uh, lots of prefabricated signs here for all of the different hospital departments. These are going to be quite important because when the hospital is uh, at its full size, we're going to be constantly picking up like little PDA recordings and finding puzzles that are going to direct us to hook up with somebody or find some information in some section of the hospital. So these signs are going to become like the map, really, for the player to know where to go. So if you're in the pathology lab and you find the uh, the PDA of, let's say, Dr. Julia Pearson. And she says that, um, you know, some information that you need is by another character who was the pediatrician. Then you know that it's a pretty good guess that you're probably going to find that character or its body somewhere near the pediatric wing of the hospital. And you can follow the signs to get you there. Uh, we also have a folder of prefabricated paintings that I used to put on the walls, a few of those, like so. And some signs. These are all the signs that are used throughout the hospital. And as you can see, I've made all of these models that you see here. You know, they're pretty distressed with a bit of metal showing through and uh, we've got lots of them that you can use in your own games. And then outside the Gary signs and wall decorations we've got Gary's props. These are of course all of the props that I have been very busy making for you over the past couple of months. And that's part of the reason really why this video, if you're following along in real time, took so long to come out where there was such a big gap. Now there was always supposed to be 
actually quite a big gap between the end of part one and the beginning of part two, just like there was quite a big gap between Lord of the Rings part one and Lord of the Rings part two, because between parts, there's quite a lot of work to do. However, we didn't intend it to be that long, but we had some setbacks on the art side, which basically meant that I had to step up and become an artist. And as for the last 58 lessons of this course, I've continually joked about how bad my modeling skills are. It meant I had to go away and watch a lot of videos and learn to do a lot of things that I hadn't done before to create somewhere in the region of about 136 prefabs to fill this hospital with. Furthermore, although we outsourced the creation of the hospital uh, to an artist when it came back, although we were happy with the basic geometry and the texturing of the corridors, all of the rooms looked the same. They all used the same wall texture, all the same floor texture. So I also then had to uh, switch out of prop mode and retexture the hospital to give us a lot more variety. And also so that we were able to um, edit and modify some of the rooms, both geometrically and texture-wise, to fit in with the story that we want to tell in the first level of Dead Earth. But we'll talk more about that later on. So as you can see in Gary's props folder, I now have provided you with lots of props in four categories that you can use within your own games. We have health and medicines. This is, you know, things like cans of food, things you can uh, pick up. There's some anti-infection pills here. And as you can see, we also have some tins of food here that if you find throughout the level and you eat them, they might give you like a little health boost. Nothing as big as kind of like, you know, some actual medicine pills. Uh, then we have some medical equipment. You see, these are all of the medical props that I've created. We have beds, and a lot of the props in here are configurable. So you can see, for example, if I select this cot and I open up the prefab of that cot and look at its hierarchy in the prefab editor, at the moment it has a white mattress, but we can turn off that white mattress and have a cot with no mattress at all, or we can turn on a blue mattress, or we can take away, let's say, the left and right sides of the cot. So now it becomes more like a children's bed. Um, we can take away the footboard. So a lot of these props are configurable. So the, although we might only have one cot, we can make lots of alterations to it. And uh, later on, when we when we do the pediatric part of the hospital, when we're gonna go into like the children's ward, we're gonna wanna see lots of cots and children's beds and we can make them all look slightly different. Once again, using the new prefab system, I can just click on that scenes icon at the top of the prefab scene view editor and I am back looking at my scene. So as you can see, we have a nice lot of medical props here and I would um, encourage you to examine them and, uh, and see what you think of them. I'm quite happy with them. They're a lot better than anything I ever thought I'd be able to create only a few months ago. And then we also have lots of prefabs that fall into the category of just office and building. Things that aren't medically related as such. Things like chairs, shower cubicles, desks, office chairs, filing cabinets, things like pairs of curtains to hang in windows, Cupboards and chests of drawers, seats, corner desks, there's even a big fridge there, and um, stools and a sofa. And once again, with the sofas and stuff like that, if you open up the prefab, you can see that uh, it's quite configurable. So you could you could actually take all of the cushions off, for example, disable all of those, and you'd just be left the bare bones of the sofa with the Hessian base showing through. Or you could just decide to put that on, but not the back cushions. Or you could just put on like one of the back cushions. Have an experiment with these props. And finally, there's also the industrial prop section, which contains things like air vents. Batteries, we'll need batteries for our night vision goggles. And uh, there is the power generator. Is that the power generator? Yeah, that's the power generator. There's going to be three of these power generators, one in each section of the hospital. And uh, I don't know whether you can see from here, if I open up the prefab, we're going to need to find these three power generators dotted throughout the hospital. We're going to need to reset the circuit breakers on them. And only when we've done all three, will that restore power to the hospital. The lights will come on and uh, we'll be able to do things like access computer systems so that we can download people's notes and, and use the elevator to escape escape the hospital. And finally, all of the models are stored in the models folder. So you can see if I go into the models folder, uh, into the scenery folder, you can see we now have this hospital new, which is that uh, section of the hospital that we're currently using. It doesn't have any of the props in. And uh, if you go into Gary's props folder, inside the models folder, you can see all of the textures and the materials that I've used there. Okay, so let's now get onto the business of creating the door system. So just to recap, at the end of part one of the Dead Earth development series, we began creating our interactive system. Interactive objects need to have a collider on them that is assigned to the interactive layer and needs to have a script on it that is derived from our interactive item base class. Let us just open up the character manager script to remind ourselves how the character interacts with interactive objects in the world. So I'm going to open up the Dead Earth folder, the scripts folder, drill down into the FPS controller folder and I'm going to open up the character manager in Visual Studio. 
Now I'm going to scroll down to the character managers update function. You are reminded that at the very top of the update function, the first thing we do is construct a ray that will go through the center of the screen where essentially our crosshair is. And we will call the physics classes ray cast all function, casting that ray on the interactive mask. In other words, we're searching for colliders that have been assigned to the interactive layer to get returned to us a list of all the colliders that that ray has intersected. Now this ray is our interaction ray. So it's very small. It's not typically going to intersect many colliders, but there is a chance where it might intersect multiple colliders in which case what we do is we iterate in a loop and we find the one that has the highest priority and that's the one that we set the text for on the HUD and also activate if the left mouse button's being pressed so just to remind ourselves you can see if we do get some colliders returned we iterate through all of the colliders and the first thing we do is we check to see if the collider we've been returned is actually an interactive object now our interactive layer is reserved for just the assignment of interactive objects so we should never have a situation where we've assigned a collider to the interactive layer and that game object doesn't have an interactive item derived mono behavior on it but we need to of course in this loop make sure that uh, it definitely does so you can see for each collider that we get returned we call the game scene managers get interactive item function passing in the colliders instance id remember and we'll take a look at this in a moment but what the interactive item does in its base class is it calls the game scene managers uh, register interactive item and uh, sending in the collider id and a reference to the interactive item script that's on it. So that our character manager, when it detects that it has intersected a collider, can call this function and get back a reference to the interactive item base class. You can see that down the bottom here, once we find an object, we say if we have a reference to the player HUD, then we set the text, the interaction text on the player HUD uh, to that retrieved from the interactive item by calling the interactive items get text function. And if the mouse button is also being pressed at the same time while our crosshair is over that interactive item, then we also call the interactive item activate function passing in uh, this which is of course a reference to this character manager as the activate functions only parameter and if we pop over to the interactive item base class you are reminded that the get text function just returns null in this base class implementation the activate function also does nothing but the start function does do something very important so it's very important when we derive anything from interactive item that we also make sure that if we override the start function that we call the base class implementation because as you can see what the base class implementation does is gets a reference to the game scene manager and it calls the register interactive item function of the game scene manager passing in the colliders instance ID as the first parameter that's the key at which the game scene manager is going to store it in its dictionary and as the value we pass this in other words a reference to this interactive item so that's basically a recap on how our interactive item system works so it stands to reason that our doors are also going to be interactive items and are going to need scripts on them that are derived from the interactive item base class now we have many doors in this hospital level and if I scroll down into the prefabs hospital and doors subfolder you can see all of the different prefabs that are in use by this level so when we're configuring our doors we really want to add all of the functionality to the prefab so that this door for example door type C might be used in let's say 10 places throughout the hospital and we don't want to add all of our functionality and scripts and colliders to all 10 doors we want to add it to the prefab and have it automatically reflect on all instances of that prefab and we're going to have to set up each door prefab type to make sure that uh, all the doors in our hospital work correctly but for the time being while we're examining what we need to do and what functionality our door script needs to have uh, we're just going to work on one door in the scene and then we'll reflect those changes back to the prefab so let me go in to the roof section here and I'm going to go down the little hatch and you see there's a door here uh, where am I? Yeah, there's the lockers. So there's the lockers there. It's the door here that leads out into the corridor. This is the door that I'm going to work on first. You'll also see that if I select this, it is door type B. That's the prefab that this uses. When we finally configure the prefabs, all of the instances of door type B will be updated and they will all just automatically work. And another thing that might be worth me pointing out is that this door script is going to be used on more than just the actual hospital doors. It's going to be used on anything that has a door or a draw that can be interacted with. So if we go down into our medical equipment prefabs folder, for example, we've got chests of drawers here. Each one of those will be controlled by a door script. In this case, the door will be used as a sliding door that will slide the drawer out and maybe reveal some contents inside. And then, of course, we've got things like these, these cupboards here. We've got the filing cabinets here. Each one of these will be an interactive door that can be opened. We've got the fridge that can be opened. 
and we also have these dresser cabinets here in several different skins um, and these have two sets of double doors so we would have um, an interactive door script operating the, the top two doors as a sort of single element and then we would have another interactive door script operating the bottom two doors so that we can open up these doors in pairs but we can open up the bottom independently from the top so our door script is not just going to make the doors in our hospital work but it's going to allow us to open up every drawer or every door on every prop in the world it's going to make our world come alive and of course it's within these cupboards and drawers that we can plant props and other interactive items that make the game worth playing things like weapons and health kits so one of the first things you'll notice if i select this door in the scene view and select it in the hierarchy you'll notice that all of the doors in the hospital have been set up such that the door itself is a child object of a parent container object which currently has nothing on it. This is by design because it's actually the parent container object that we want to be the interactive item. This is the object to which we're going to add our interactive door script and the object that we're going to put on the interactive layer and the object we need to add our trigger to. Now unlike our usual interactive items which can have any type of collider on them, our interactive door script is going to insist that a box collider is put on it and that's because we're going to need to interact with that collider and scale it and offset its center point so we need to have a collider that we know exactly what it is and something that we can easily offset its center and extents so with this door selected in the hierarchy let us first of all assign it to the interactive layer now it's going to ask me if I wish to assign this to the child objects. That isn't necessary. In fact, we don't really want to do that. So we're going to say no, we only want the parent object to be on the interactive layer. This object is going to be responsible via the interactive door script for animating the child object and any children of that door. With the parent object on the interactive layer, I'm now going to add a box collider. And as you can see, the box collider is currently centered around the sort of pivot point of the door, which is on its left hand side where its hinges would be. So let's sort of offset this a little bit, get it kind of in the center of the door as much as possible. And we'll go to the edit collider button and that will allow us to more easily stretch out the shape of the door. I mean, this trigger doesn't actually need to be exactly the size of the door anyway, because it's just the interactive zone. But I think it makes sense to sort of make it, if anything, maybe slightly bigger than the door. Okay, so let me then click the button to stop editing the collider. Now, we do want the trigger. Actually, let me select the is trigger boolean on the box collider component. Now we do want this box collider to probably be bigger than the door, okay, because our interactive array that is cast by our character manager is quite small. So we don't want to force the player to get right up against the door in order to, for it to become interactive. But we also want to make sure that we don't make it too baggy because if we allow the center point of our FPS controller to actually get inside the trigger itself, well, Unity's ray casting functions, if the origin of the ray of a ray cast is inside the trigger to begin with, then it won't return a collision. So we want to make sure that it's not so baggy that at least half of the character controller can get inside the trigger so I think at the moment that's too big so I think what we'll do is we will let's look at the local axes also make sure while you're doing this with me guys that you put the axis mode from global into local if it's not already and you can see actually that with the way that this door is authored it's sort of perceived forward vector at least as we perceive it is actually its local y-axis and its local z-axis is pointing up and we're going to talk a little bit about this in a moment but all of the doors and various interactive objects in our level often have local axes oriented in a way that you wouldn't expect so we can't just assume that the local y-axis is always the up for the object and the local z-axis is always pointing forward so we're going to need to write a door script that can handle these various object hierarchies having their various stages in the hierarchy rotated and oriented in any way that uh, might come our way we need a script that's going to deal with that so i think if it's the local y-axis i need to put the size of this down quite a bit pull it in i think probably probably maybe a little bit thicker maybe 0 0.5 maybe something like that oh actually before we continue what we haven't got in our scene at the moment is the player hud but i did prefab it so let's go into our prefabs folder and let's drag the player HUD into the scene, like so. And let's open up the player HUD and that mission text, which currently says 
escape the elevator. Let's just leave that blank for now. Either in the next lesson or the lesson after, we're going to create the proper Dead Earth HUD, okay? This is just the Creeper HUD, and it's very basic and pretty crappy looking. But don't worry, we're going to do something much better later on. But the only reason I'm putting the HUD in the scene now is that when we start working on the interactive script and we walk up to the door, we want it to say things on the HUD, like the door is open or the door is closed, whatever. But we won't be able to see if it's sending us any text if we haven't got a HUD that is capable of displaying it. Now, although we've added the HUD to the scene, the character manager doesn't know about it. So select our FPS controller rig, scroll down and open up the character manager component. And you'll see that there is a player HUD field there, which is currently set to none. So let's drag a reference to our player HUD in there. And then our character manager can now talk to that HUD. It's not going to do anything at the moment though, because we haven't got an interactive script on our door. So let's talk a little bit about how this door is going to work and how it should work. So we know that at the moment, if we had our interactive door script already written and on this parent object, then when our FPS controller approached it and that interactive array intersected this collider, then we know the character manager would call the interactive doors get text script. Our door would return some relevant text to display on the HUD. And we also know that if the left mouse button was pressed, then the character manager would call the doors activate function. And of course, it's the activate function which is going to be responsible for opening the door. Now, in this particular case, where we can see that although the door's local z-axis is pointing up, as far as we're concerned, it's perceived forward vector is actually its local y-axis. Well, then we can see that what we want to do is create an animation. And if I select the, the child door and bring the rotation gizmo up, that means that really we want to rotate it around its z-axis as that's that's its up vector as far as we're concerned. So you can see what we want to do is, is this, right? And open it like that or open it like that. Now, one of the things that we want to do, like I said, we don't want to put the parent trigger on the door itself because if the door rotates, well, then the interactive trigger is going to rotate with it and then it'll be kind of weird, right? Because it will have rotated away from us and we'll no longer be able to interact with it. So that's not what we want. But what we do want to do is when the door is open, and we'll make this optional in our script, but when the door is open, we often want to grow the trigger and maybe offset its center point a little bit. So what we want to do in this particular case where this parent objects, let me just call up the translation gizmo a minute, yeah. So the y-axis is its local forward vector, is when the door is open, we wish to sort of increase the size of the y-extents of the box collider and offset its center point a little bit by half that amount so that it now sits flush with this side. And I'll tell you why we're gonna do that in a moment. So let me just say we put the size up to say something like two for now. Actually, I'll put it to 1.4 and I will set the Y center position of the box to something like 0.8. This is just to demonstrate my point. So you can see when the door opens, what we do is we kind of slide the box collider out and we make it bigger. Now, the reason that we do this is because what we don't really want to happen is we don't want the player to be able to be stood in this position such that they can close the door on themselves. I mean, it's still going to be possible to do that, but it makes no sense really for the player to be able to stand right in the path of a closing door and close it. And remember what I said, remember I said that when we do a ray cast, if the origin of the ray is inside the trigger to begin with, then no intersection is registered, which means that when we move the collider like this and the door is open, we still on this side of the door have our ray intersecting the collider. But as we walk through the door, we are now inside the collider and we're not registering this as an interactive item yet. So we can't close it while we're in this zone until, of course, we walk out of the collider over this way or that way or around here, and then we can close the door. So it gives us kind of a different interactive zone on each side of the door. So from here, we can get right up against the door and close it. But on this side, it forces us to get clear of the door in order to close it. And that's pretty cool. You don't have to do this, and we will make this optional in our script, but I've just found that this gives much greater playability. So let me just put the collider back to its original size, and um, I'll close the door again. So obviously in our interactive door script, we're going to need some variables exposed via the inspector where we can specify like a scalar, how much we wish to grow the box collider and also whether we wish to offset its center point as well. Now, the reason I'm making this optional is because we are going to support both sliding doors and rotating doors, right? So in the case of a rotating door, we would, like I said, rotate it around its local Z axis like so. And in the case of a sliding door, then of course we will move it whichever direction we wish to move it in. And in the case 
case of a sliding door, then we probably don't wish to grow its collider because we still want the interactive area either side of a sliding door to remain constant. We're also going to support the idea of automatically opening and closing doors. And that's another reason why we're going to make the grow and the offset of the collider optional. So although in the hospital, I don't really have any automatic doors, I mean, I could make some of these double doors automatic. Wouldn't really make sense because they've got handles on them. But I will do this to, to test the automatic door feature. But what we'll do in that particular case is we will make a collider that is much bigger than the door itself. It won't be a tight hugging collider like we've put on this door. It'll be much bigger. So maybe we enter the trigger here. And in the case of an automatic door, we don't have to press the, the use button to activate. We just walk into the trigger and the door will open. And then we'll, what we'll do is we'll let it auto close after a certain time period has passed. So, you know, we, we have quite a lot of different functionality that we wish to support, sort of manually opening, closing doors, automatically opening doors, rotating and sliding doors. And another thing that's really important is we wish to support two-way doors. Now in real life doors don't generally open in both directions unless of course you're talking about the sort of doors you get on a saloon bar in the wild west but for playability wise it's often good to to break that realism and always have the door open up in the direction opposite to the the side of the door you're standing on and the reason being is it, let's imagine that we ha we're being chased by a zombie right and we come up against this door and the zombie's hot on our tails and we decide to open the door but I think we can see with this door that in reality it would actually open that way into us well first of all that's probably going to get us killed because the door is going to open into us we're going to get kind of stuck or pushed around by the door collider and we're not going to be able to get into the door and the zombie is going to have got us and killed us at that point so what we would like to happen is when we're on this side of the door if we're being chased we press open and it opens that way and of course when we're on the other side of the door we want to reverse the rotation angle that we specify and open it that way instead. Once again, I'm going to make this optional, but I've really found that you want to have two-way doors in almost all cases, just from a playability standpoint. Also, there's one other thing that I should just point out, and that is when this level originally was handed to me, the doors had mesh colliders on them. You can see this door here has a mesh collider on it at the moment, although I've currently deactivated it. I deactivated all of the doors in this demo so that when I gave you the preview of the level, you weren't just stuck in one room. You could walk through all the doors, but we're going to want to enable all of the colliders on the doors, and we'll do that in a moment, but we'll do it at the prefab level. But we don't want to have mesh colliders on our doors. We actually want to have have box colliders and the reason we want to use box colliders is that unity's physics system works much more reliably with primitive colliders things such as boxes spheres and capsules the mathematics is very simple when dealing with these objects and we can get very predictable collision response results what i found is when i was doing the test run for this lesson and i left the mesh colliders in place well, if I walked up to a door and the door did close on me, or perhaps we didn't have two-way doors and we did have them open up into our character controller, I found the response from a mesh collide on the door really unpredictable. Like sometimes if the door opened into me, it would fling my FPS controller like five to 10 feet back. Sometimes it would fling me over to the other side of the room and it was a very jerky and jittery affair because the collision system just can't really accurately resolve a mesh collider because it can be any arbitrary shape. However, you put a box collider on a door, then all of a sudden it interacts with our FPS character controller very reliably and in the case where let's say we are stood in a door and it auto closes on us it correctly you know catches our controller and pushes it into the room slides it into the room just as we would expect. Um, so actually before we carry on why don't we go and do that now because I'm going to forget otherwise. So I'm going to drill down into my prefabs folder, into my doors folder, and I'm going to edit each of my doors. So I'm going to start with this alternative steel door, open prefab. Uh, this one hasn't got a collider on at all yet, so let's add a box collider to that one. I'm going to have to do a little bit more work on this one actually in a moment because that one doesn't have a parent object by the look of it. Um, then I'm going to double click on the next door. That's another way you can open up the prefab editor. Just double click on it like so. Oh, actually, let me go back. Yeah, I, I, you don't want these colliders to be triggers, okay? Um, they need to be colliders. This is what's going to make the door solid. Uh, let's open up our double door here. Let's select the left door. Let's remove the mesh collider. And let's add a box collider. And let's do the same for the other child as well. Remove the mesh collider, add the box collider. And I'm gonna do this for all of these doors, okay? So let me multi-select these, make these a bit easier. Remove both the mesh collider components, add two box collider components to each door. Door type A, 
We're drilling down to find the actual door itself, right? So that's this object here on door type A. The rest of them are the labels that we uh, we use to put fonts on the front of the door. Things like names, like that's Dr. Julia Pearson's office there. I'm just using fonts to do that. Uh, it makes it nice and easy for us to edit the text on the doors without having to go in and make some alterations to textures. So once again, on this door, select the child door object, remove the mesh collider component, add the box collider. Move along to door type B, do exactly the same thing again to the child object. Remove the mesh collider, add the box collider. Do the same to door type C, select the door object. Looks like that one's already got a box collider on it. That's good, don't need to uh, do it to that one by the look of it. Um, let's go into exterior door here. Let's remove the mesh colliders from those two doors. Add box colliders. Uh, we'll leave manhole cover, what's that? Oh, morgue door and toilet door. Yeah, we can. We won't be doing anything with toilet door in this lesson just yet. We'll be doing that in the next lesson. By the way, guys, this door lesson is going to span two videos, okay? What I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to work on just the animation of the door. You know, the rotation and the sliding and the auto-closing and all that stuff. But what I'm going to do in the next lesson is I'm going to add the sound effects to it. And the reason I'm putting that into another lesson is because the sound effects isn't something as simple as just playing a one-shot sound. What we need to do is actually scale the animation to the duration of the sound effect. In fact, it's even more complex than that because often if you look at a door sound effect, the actual, let's say you're thinking of a, a sound effect of a door that slams, you might actually find that the actual impact point in the sound effect might only be halfway through the audio clip and the rest of the audio clip is really just the reverberation of the door slam tapering off. So we want to make sure that we provide a system where we don't just say to the door play this sound when you open but we say only perform the opening and closing animation within this given range within the sound clip that's being played and also scale the length of the animating door to that it's amazing how rubbish it looks if you don't really synchronize very closely the sound of the door closing okay so i'm on the toilet door i'll remove the mesh collider and i will add the box collider there you go and let's press the scenes button now to go back to our door and you see if i select that door now the the mesh collider is now gone and it's been replaced by the box collider, which is what we want. Okay, so we've discussed how this parent object of the door needs to have a box collider on it as a trigger on the interactive layer. And we also need the ability in our script to resize and offset that collider when the door is open. We've also discussed how we want doors, in the case of rotating doors, to be able to open both ways. We need a way to figure out what side of the door our character is on and make sure we open it in the opposing direction. We've also discussed how we want to have automatically opening and closing doors. Like I said, I haven't got any doors in this hospital that I want to automatically open and close, but I do have a really cool sound effect, which you already have in your project at the moment. And if we go into the sounds folder, you'll notice now in this project, in scenes sounds there is a folder called doors and there's this door closing sound which is really cool i just need to find it is it that one no that's the standard door closing sound no ah, it's this one here door sound four okay so imagine this imagine we don't have doors that automatically open but we do have some of our doors automatically close after a random period of time. So imagine we open up this door and we're looking around inside the office and then all of a sudden we hear and it's the door just slowly closing by itself. And also imagine you're walking around the hospital and some door that you might have opened some time ago starts to creak shut like this. It's gonna scare you, right? You're gonna kind of, you're gonna hear this sound that it doesn't feel like you're responsible for. And you're gonna think, oh my God, a zombie's opening a door or coming for me. So you can see in the case of this sound here, we're gonna want the door animation to, to close very slowly, but in the case of this door closing sound, which is the standard door closing sound, when we close the door very quickly. You can also see what I was saying about we can't just let the animation play for the duration of the audio clip. When we play this sound, we only want the animation of the door to sort of start at the beginning of the sound, but be over by the time it gets to this impact point in the center of the sound. But we don't want to trim the sound down to that length because, you know, otherwise we'll, we'll hear the sound clip sort of cut off. We should naturally hear that closing slam sort of reverberate a little bit. So that's why we're going to need to do some pretty funky stuff with our audio system to make this happen. So we're going to do the sound stuff in the next lesson. Now, one other thing 
Um, and this is and this is both a good thing and a bad thing, right? Um, the bad thing is that all of the interactive objects or the doors that we're going to use as interactive objects in this level all have completely different sets of local axes. So, for example, if I select this door, then we can see that the door itself, the child door, needs to rotate around its local z-axis, like so. Um, and that's fine. So we're going to need to, in our script, as we assign each door to our script, we're going to need to tell our script which local axis of that door we wish to rotate it around. And we also have the axes of the parent object to factor in as well, because we need to know what we consider to be the forward vector, which in the case of this particular door and its parent object, we can see that the y-axis is its forward vector. And the reason we need to know that is because, first of all, we're going to need to know what direction in which to grow and offset the collider, which in this particular case, we would need to push it along its local y-axis. But we also need to know which way the door is facing because we're going to create a plane. Uh, we're going to use the position of the object, which should be right in the center of the door, as the point on that plane. And we're going to use the y-axis in this particular case, the local y-axis, as the forward direction of that plane. And then once we have that plane, if you imagine like what we have is sort of a polygon filling that doorway right in the middle of that doorway. But imagine that polygon has no edges, so it goes on forever, right? That's what a plane is. Uh, once we have the plane, we can use uh, the plane API to ask it what side of the plane our player is. So in this particular case, because this plane is facing um, forward, like so, this is the, the plane normal, so to speak. Right now, I would be on the front side of the plane, so I would know to rotate the door backwards. But if I were stood here, well, now I'm on the back side of the plane because the plane normally is facing away from me, and then I need to, to flick the rotation angle that I've specified. So if we were here, for example, in front of the door, and we specified we wish to rotate it 90 degrees, right? Then if we're over here, then we wish to rotate it minus 90 degrees in the opposite direction. Um, oh, finally, let me just say that what's going to happen with this door is when we activate it, we're actually going to perform the animation via a coroutine, okay? So... If, by default, before we add the sound, because the door's animation is actually going to be decided by the length of the sound that we assign it. Um, in this lesson, we're not going to assign sound, so I'll probably just give it like a one and a half second animation, right? So if we imagine we open this door, and uh, a coroutine starts to play, which opens this door, you know, like so, right? Or this way. What happens if the door is only halfway open, and then we activate it again, toggling it? like so. So what we're going to do is we're also going to put in our code a way for the coroutines to be elegantly interrupted halfway through and then, you know, a new coroutine started that that kind of maintains the time of the animation that we'd got to in the previous coroutine. And this is quite easy to do because we know that doors work in a toggle system, right? So if we are opening up a door and let's say, for example, we are 75% open, we know if while it's 75% open and it's still opening, if I was then to toggle to close the door, we don't want to start that animation from t equals zero. Because if a door is 75% open, it also means it's 25% closed. So that means as we switch into closing mode, as long as we remember what the t value was in the previous coroutine, we can start the animation from t equals 0 0.25, not t equals zero. So in this particular case, the animation would start with the door already being a quarter closed. Um, and like I said, in this lesson, we're just going to work on this one door and it's all really going to come together in the next lesson when we add the sound and then we're going to start going around all of the other doors and configuring them. But uh, without further ado, let's now create our interactive door script. So I'm going to drill down into my scripts folder and drill down into my interactive items folder and I'm going to create a new C Sharp script and I'm going to call this interactive door dun, dun, dun. and then for now I'm just, because we're just working on the scene object I'm going to select the parent object of our door not the child the parent object and I'm going to drag our interactive door script onto it and I'm going to open up that script in Visual Studio okay so the first thing we'll do is we'll get rid of the update function because our interactive items don't usually need an update function in fact the only public functions that we will implement in this class will be those that we override from the base class, which will be the getText function and the activate function. But 
Talking of base class, we need to make sure that interactive door is not derived directly from mono behavior, but is instead derived from interactive item, like so. And of course, because the interactive item base class has a start function, we need to make sure that we alter its modifier. So instead of just saying void start, we need to say protected override void start, because we want to override the start function of the base class. And what I'll do next, so I don't forget, because we've overridden the start function, I will put right at the top of that function a call to the base class version of the start function, because that is very important and I don't want to forget to do it. Remember, it's the base class implementation of the start function that not only caches references to the game scene manager and the collider that's on this object, but it also registers the collider and the interactive item with our game scene manager's interactive item database. So if we forgot to do that, when our character manager can cast array that intersected this collider, our character manager wouldn't be able to fetch a valid reference to the interactive item and they wouldn't be able to call its get text or activate functions. Okay, so let's now work on the inspector assigned the variables that we're going to need our class to have so that we can configure all of the functionality that we've talked about so far. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do right at the top of our class is I'm going to add a comment and I'm also going to add a require component attribute because although our interactive item base class requires a collider component, our interactive door class needs to require a very specific type of collider, which is a box collider. So you can see I've said require component type of box collider. Okay, let's now work on those inspector assigned variables. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use that header attribute so that I can format the inspector nicely and I can have a nice subsection header that says activation properties. What I'm also going to do, because this is going to be an inspector with quite a lot of properties, it could be quite confusing for the person using it. So I'm going to use an attribute that you haven't seen me use before, which is the tooltip attribute. And by formatting the tooltip attribute like this, you can see I open up a set of square braces just like any other attribute and I say tooltip and then in brackets I put a string of text and that is the text that will show up in the editor when you move the mouse over this property. So the first property I'm going to add is going to be a serialized protected boolean called is closed and that basically just identifies whether the door is currently open or closed but it's also our means of identifying whether we wish the door to be open or closed at level startup because remember I said when we're setting our level up we want to close all of the doors by default because this script is going to sort of cache the current transform of the door as its closed position and rotation but if we set the is closed boolean to false then our start function will make sure that that door is open at level startup and I've set this to true by default so if we don't alter this by default all doors will remain closed when the level starts up Next, I'm going to add another Boolean and I'm going to call this is two way. In other words, should this door open in both directions? And I'm going to make this the default because like I said, from play testing, I found that you really increase playability if you always make sure that the door opens in the opposite direction to the side of the plane that you are stood on. So the door doesn't open up into you. And once again, I've added a tool tip so that we move the mouse over this property in the inspector. It will say, does the door open in both directions? Next up, I'm going to add another boolean called auto open. This is set to false by default but if we set it to true in the inspector then the trigger that is on the parent object will no longer work like an interactive item in the standard sense but when the player's collider enters this trigger the activation of the door will automatically be triggered so it will automatically open. Now I don't think I'm going to have any doors in my hospital that automatically open but let's create a script that is generic as possible so that we can use it perhaps in another game or on another level where we do want to have an automatic automatically opening the door. Next up, we're going to add an auto close boolean to describe whether we would like the door to automatically close. Now, I am going to have many of my doors automatically close and I want them to, to close after some random period of time because I think it just makes it darn creepy. Now, unlike the auto open feature, which is activated when the player's collider enters the parent door's trigger, the auto close feature doesn't work on that. It just works on a timer. I find that in practice this worked better. So when the door is animated into its open position, once the door is opened, some timer is set and when that timer expires, the door will close. So how much time do we want to put on that timer? Well, we want that to be configurable via the inspector also. So next up, I'm going to declare a protected vector two, which I've called auto close delay, where the X component will allow us to specify the minimum amount of seconds that should pass before the door should close. And the Y component should specify the maximum number 
of seconds that should elapse. Okay, so next up, I want a float that is going to describe how much I would like to scale the collider in its perceived forward direction when the door is open. I'm going to set this to three by default, but we'll have to see what that plays like in the actual game in a moment once we've got this script finished, and then we can configure all of this via the inspector. And then I'm going to declare a protected Boolean called offset collider. This is set to true by default. You remember when I said that uh, we often want to scale and offset the collider on the parent object, I also said that these would be optional. So if we want, we can offset the collider, but not scale it just by setting offset collider to true and collider length open scale to one. In that case, the collider wouldn't be scaled at all, but would still be offset. Or of course, we could just set offset collider to false, which is often what you're going to want to do in the case of a sliding door where you don't want to grow the collider or offset the collider. In such a case, you would set the collider length open scale to one and you would set offset collider to false. But for our rotating doors, which this has been set up for by default, we want the collider to scale and we wish to offset its position so that it predominantly lies in the open half space of the door. Next up, I'm going to add a protected transform called contents mount. Now, we haven't discussed this so far, but bear in mind that it's not just the basic doors in our hospital that we're going to use this script on. We're also going to use this script on things like the doors on cabinets. Now, the problem is with the doors on cabinets, they are interactive items, and they also might have objects in them that also have colliders that are interactive items. So let's say, for example, you put a pistol inside a desk drawer. Now, when the drawer is closed, it could be that the box collider on the pistol is actually poking up through the desk and you would be picking that object instead of the drawer object. So what we're going to do is whenever we put something inside a cabinet or a drawer, we're going to make sure that we make it a child of the door's contents mount. What this script would do is when the door is closed, it will disable all of the colliders of its child content. So in the case where we had that pistol inside the drawer, even if our ray was intersecting that first, it wouldn't register it because the collider is going to be turned off until the drawer is open and its contents been exposed. So for each of our doors, we're going to generate a child transform called contents and any objects that we wish to put in a cabinet or a drawer, we're just going to make sure that we attach them as children of that contents mount. And we'll set this to null by default and we'll set it up via the inspector. Okay, so next up, we need a way of describing to our door script what the, the parent object considers to be its forward vector. Remember, when we looked back at our door in the editor just now, the, the actual local forward vector of the object was pointing up the local z-axis, but the perceived local forward vector, as far as we're concerned, was actually its y-axis. So we need a way of letting the parent object know that in the case of the door we're currently working on, we consider its y-axis to be its forward vector, and that's the vector in the direction that we wish to scale the collider and offset its center point when the door is open. So you can see what I've done is I've created a protected variable of type interactive door axis alignment. And I've called this local forward axis and I've set this to interactive door axis alignment dot z axis by default. Now, first of all, we're getting an error because this enumeration doesn't even exist yet. We're going to create that now. And by default, I've set this to z axis, but we also know that when we look at the door we're currently working on in the editor, we're going to want to change change this via the inspector to the Y axis, but, but I've set this to Z axis in the code by default, because I do believe that that will be the most likely case with props and doors that you're dealing with. Okay, so let's just temporarily go out to the top of the file and let's define a new enumeration called interactive door axis alignment, which has three members, X axis, Y axis, Z axis. You can see now if we scroll back down to that line we just added, we are no longer getting an error because this is now a valid enumerated type. And like I said, we, this variable is called local forward axis. In other words, it's describing the local forward axis as far as we're concerned of the parent door object, the object with the interactive trigger on it. Okay, so next up, I'm gonna create a new header in our inspector because that pretty much is all of the activation properties and the way our door behaves. But what we want to do now is we want to talk about a door that might require some states in our application state dictionary to be set, or even some doors that won't open unless you've got a certain object or multiple objects in your inventory. Now, we haven't created our inventory system yet. We'll be doing that in a few lessons time. So for now, we're just going to create some kind of fake stub stuff for that. Just like our generic trigger that we created in our Creeper project, we want the ability 
via the inspector to specify a list of game states that must be set in the application's game state dictionary in order for this door to open. So I'm going to create a protected list of game states and I'm going to call this required states. And this will give us a nice list or a nice array in the inspector that allows us to type various states that this door might require to be set in order for it to be activated. I also said that we're going to have a door that might require certain inventory items to be in the player's inventory in order for the door to be open. Now, like I said, we haven't developed the inventory system. We haven't even talked about the inventory system yet. But just know for now, at its core, the inventory manager itself will store inventory items as a series of string IDs. Therefore, from any other game object's perspective, the inventory is really just a list of strings. So I'm going to create another protected list of strings and I'm going to call this required items. And what you'll see is once we've created our inventory, what we'll be able to do in any door script is we'll be able to list a series of inventory string IDs. In other words, the items that are required to be on the player's person in order for them to be able to activate the door. But I don't want you to dwell too much on this for now because for the moment, we're just going to create a temporary little function that just returns true always because, you know, we haven't created the inventory yet. Okay, so that's the game statement management section done of the inspector. Let's now work on the messages that are being sent to the HUD when the player is interacting with this object. There's going to be three that are possibly displayed. One when the door is open, when when the door is closed, and one when the door is locked. So we'll create a string called opened hint text. This is what will be displayed on the HUD when the door is open. You can see by default I set this to door. Press use to close. I'm going to create another string and this is going to be called closed hint text. And as you can see by default I set this to door, press use to open, because remember it's closed, so using the door will open it. And finally, I'll create another string called can't activate hint text, which is sent to the HUD when we can't activate the door, which normally means it's locked. But, you know, we can change all of these messages via the inspector. That's our message section of the inspector done. Okay, so next up, I'm going to create another section called door transforms. And this is basically going to be a list where we get to specify all of the information about which child game object, which door should be animated by this script, and also some additional information such as how much it should be rotated, which axis it should be rotated about, or whether it should be rotated at all. Perhaps it's a sliding door, in which case we will specify which axis we wish it to move along and how much we wish it to move along that axis. So let's create a tooltip that says a list of child transforms to animate and then we are going to create a protected list of interactive door info objects. Now obviously we haven't created this class yet, we're going to create that right now. But each of these interactive door info objects is going to describe the information about precisely one door that this script is animating. Now the reason I make a point of that is that there are many double door sets in this level. So in the case of a set of double Double doors, uh, we want it to act like one door, right? So that we, we have one interactive item, the parent, that opens both those doors. In that particular case, we would have one parent with the interactive door script on it, but we would have two child door objects, each one being represented by an interactive door info object describing uh, the direction that we wish it to rotate. And that's quite important, actually, because normally you'll find that if it's a set of double doors, um, although they might share the same local axis orientation, you kind of want them to open in opposite directions locally. If you imagine the doors are mirrors of each other, if you want the, the door on the left to rotate counterclockwise around its up vector, then in order to match that, the door on the right needs to rotate clockwise around that same vector so that they open outwards together. Okay, so let's go at the top of the script now and let's create our interactive door info class. Okay, so I'm going to create a public class called interactive door info. I've added a nice comment above so we know what this represents. And I also want to add the system.serializable attribute because we're going to store this in a list in the mono behavior. If we add this, then it means that that information will be correctly serialized. Okay, so the first member of this class is going to be a transform. This is going to be the transform of the game object that we wish to animate, so the child door. We'll set this to null by default. This all needs to be hooked up via the inspector. Then I'm going to declare a public vector three called rotation. Now this vector allows us to specify the local axis of the door we wish it to rotate around and also the number of degrees we wish to rotate around it. 
Let's say, for example, we wish to rotate around the y-axis by 90 degrees. We would set this to 0, 90, and 0 for its x, y, and z components, respectively. Remember, this is the door's local axis, not the parent object's local axis. And you'll see me setting this up in a moment, and it'll all make sense. Next up, we're going to declare a vector 3 called movement. Just like the rotation vector, if it's a sliding door or a draw, then this will allow us to specify the local axis of the door or the draw that we wish to move along and the distance that we wish to move along it. So if we wanted to move a door five units along its local z-axis, we would set this vector to 0, 0, 5, right, for x, y, and z, respectively. Okay, so next up, we're going to declare some variables that we don't want to show up in the inspector, but they're going to be used at runtime by our interactive door script to cache information about this door. Things such as what the rotation of it is in its closed rotation. So we'll create a quaternion. Now we'll set this to an identity quaternion by default here, but you'll see in the startup function of our interactive door script in a moment, you're going to see that when we're processing these doors, for each interactive door object, we're going to grab the rotation because remember, we're assuming that all doors have been rotated and positioned such that they're in their closed position and orientation. So at startup, we're going to grab the rotation from the transform and store it here in the closed rotation member of the door. And likewise, we're going to create another quaternion called open rotation so that during the closing of a door, basically, we get to, we get somewhere to cache the rotation of the door in its open rotation. And then we can just slurp between the open and closed rotation quaternions. Actually, we'll probably lerp because we're going to do a linear open. So we'll probably get a better effect if we actually linearly interpolate between those rotations. Next up, I also want to cache what the open position of the door should be if it's a, if it's a moving door and what the closed position of the door should be, which of course if it's a sliding door will be the position that it's in at startup so we'll just grab the position from the transform of the door and store it in here so these are all just used during the operation of the interactive door to kind of store some information so that we can get to it in a handy fashion so that is our interactive door info object done. From our perspective in the editor, all we have to worry about is assigning a transform and assigning either a rotation vector or a movement vector. That's all we have to worry about setting up. Okay, so let's now carry on with our interactive rotating door object. That's all the inspector assigned variables done. Let's now work on the private variables. First thing we're going to need to do is declare an I enumerator so that we can keep track of whether our opening or closing coroutine is currently running. We can't just start the coroutine and forget about it because if the coroutine is halfway through, let's say the door is halfway through being opened and we want to start another coroutine to close the door, then we need to have a reference to the coroutine so we can stop it. And that's why we, when we start the coroutine, we store a reference to its I enumerator in this variable here. Because we might want to offset and stretch the collider of the parent object when the door is open, we're going to declare two vector threes that we'll use to store the closed collider sized and the closed collider center. Remember, these are going to be the size and the center of the collider at level startup. We're assuming that all doors start in the closed position. And that's also true of the collider on the parent object. So for this, we're just going to be grabbing what the current size and the current center position of our box collider is and storing it in these variables. Then we'll declare two more vector threes that we can use to pre-calculate what the open collider size will be and what the open collider center position will be. And you'll see us calculating these in the start function. Now next, I declare a protective variable of type box collider so that we can cache a reference to the box collider on this object. Now, the base class version of the start function already caches a reference to the collider, but we don't need a collider reference. We need a box collider reference. So what we'll do in our start function is we'll grab the collider reference that is stored in the base class and we'll cast it to a box collider because we need a box collider reference because only a box collider has things such as the collider size and the center point that we can alter. Next up, we declare a protected variable of type plane. You'll see we use Unity's plane class in a moment to classify the character manager's position against this plane so that we can detect whether we are in front of the door or behind the door and determine which way the door should open. Next up, I'm going to declare a float variable called normalized time. You've probably seen me do this many times in the past that when a coroutine runs and we need to animate something over a period of time, what we'll normally do is we'll normally start a while loop and we'll say something like while time is less than duration. And in the middle of that loop, we'll calculate a t value by saying t equals time over duration. And that means that t will climb up from zero to one during the lifetime of that while loop. Now, that's how we normally animate things 
things, but in this particular case, because coroutines can be interrupted, we want to store the t value, what I call the normalized time value, as a class variable. So that's all of our variables done. Let's now work on our get text function that we need to override from the base class, which is going to send text back to the character manager for display on the HUD. Okay, so I'm going to put my get text function above the start function here. Um, it needs to be a public function, and we need to use the override function modifier because we're overriding this from the base class. Now, one of the things that we're going to need to sort out is we said that doors need to also behave differently depending on what states are set in the game state dictionary and also what items are in the inventory. And that's also going to influence how text is returned to the HUD as well. So we need to deal with that now, really. So I think what I'm going to do is just underneath where the get text function is defined I'm going to put a little placeholder function that just always returns true which I've called have required inventory items okay so for now we're just using this to to put something in until the inventory is created so at the top of the function we'll just create a boolean a local boolean called have inventory items and of course we're just assigning this to true always we're just calling that function but what we'll do eventually is we'll probably make a call directly into the character manager's inventory to get that information and we'll pass it a list of all the strings describing all of the inventory items that might have been specified in the inspector of this script that need to uh, to be present in the player's inventory in fact that's also brought one other thing to my attention I also said that we're going to need to check whether we have a series of game states set in the applications game state dictionary now we've done this before haven't we remember at the end of creeper we created our very cool interactive generic switch script which is still in the project and we're going to be using this many times I would imagine throughout our code now one of the things that script did is it allowed us to do much what we want to do here which is list a series of game states and check if they're set in the applications game state dictionary and we actually implemented a function in that class called our required states set there's going to be a lot of objects in our world that are probably going to want to make similar requests to the application manager so really we should have a function like this in the application manager itself otherwise we're going to end end up implementing a function like this in every interactive item that needs to check states with the application manager. So I think what we'll do is we'll do that now. So let's open up our application manager script. Remember, this is in our root scripts folder. So I'm going to open up the application manager and let's scroll down and we'll put this new function, I think, underneath the reset game states function. OK, and we'll call this uh, our states set. It returns a boolean true with all of the states passed a set false otherwise and as you can see as its only parameter it is passed a list of game states which I've called required states so in this code we're going to literally just copy pretty much what we had in the interactive generic switch or required state set function we're just going to iterate through all of the states and just check that each state is set and if we find any state either isn't defined or it's been set to a value other than the ones that we require them to be set to then the function in our application manager is going to immediately return false so let's set up a for loop to iterate through all of the states in the list that we've just passed in and for each one we're going to fetch out the game state that we wish to check and then we're going to use the application manager's get game state function passing in the key of the state which of course returns the string the result of the state what that state is set to in the application manager's database and we'll say if we get return null or an empty string or if the value that is returned isn't equal to the value that is in the state that we've passed in other words, the state does exist in the dictionary, but it's not set to what we want it to be set to, then the states do not match. The required states are not set, and we return false. Otherwise, at the bottom of the function, where we fall through to, we return true. And that now is that function added to our application manager, which means any object, including our interactive door script, can call that now and uh, easily figure out whether all of the states that have been specified are set in the application manager. So let's use that now. Okay, so at the top of the function, I'm setting have required states to true then I'm going to check that we have set some required states in this scripts inspector because if we haven't then it means we have no required states that need to be set to open this door and that's why we set it to true by default right because if there are no states we want that to count as if there were states and they were all set correctly but if we do have some states set then what we need to do is see if there is an application manager instance in the scene which of course there should be but we'll just put some handling in there just in case we forgot to add the application manager to the scene so we'll say if we have some states 
that we require to be set. And there is no application manager in the scene. If application manager dot instance is no, then we will set have required states to false. Okay. So if we have forgot to add an application manager to the scene, but this door requires certain states that have been set, then we will count that as if the states are not set correctly and we will be refused access to this door. Otherwise, if there is an application manager in the scene, then let's call its our states set function. Remember, that's the function we just implemented in our application manager. And we will pass in the required states, which of course we've set up via the inspector of this script. And that will return true if all of those states are set and false if they're not. And we store the result in the have required states boolean. So by the time we get here, have required states correctly reflects whether the states are set correctly to open this door. So let's first handle the case where the door is closed and we want to open it. Well, we should only be able to open the door if we have all the required inventory items and have all the required states set. So we'll say if we don't have the required states set or we don't have the inventory items that are needed to open this door, then we will return the can't activate hint text. So that could be that like the door is locked, the door doesn't open, whatever we type in in the inspector. Now, by default, we've set it to door, it's locked, but you'll want to set that via the inspector to something that makes more sense. If we do have the required states, or we do have the required inventory items, well, then we return the closed hint text. So in the case of this closed door, we would return press use to open, right? So it's, in that case, our get text function has already detected that if we don't have the states or the relevant items in our inventory, then it it returns the door is locked otherwise it returns press use to open otherwise if the door isn't closed then we always just return the opened hint text it seems to make sense to me that even if you don't have the required items to open a door you should probably always still be able to close the door right i shut myself out of my house all the time i need a key to get into my house but i don't need a bloody key to close the front door and lock myself out of it so i kind of implemented this door in the get text function using that same philosophy okay so that's our get text function done Okay, so let's now go back to the editor and just check what our inspector looks like to our interactive object script. Let me just wait for the script to compile. Hey, and there you can see we have uh, all of those inspector assigned variables. We have lists where we can specify required items in the inventory or required states in the game state manager. We also have that local forward axis drop down where we can specify the X, Y, and Z axis. So for this particular door, in order to know how to set that, remember this is what describes the forward looking vector of the parent object. The object with the trigger on we select that parent object and we make sure that the gizmo is in local mode and we just look at the axis which is pointing forward which in this case is the green one if you look up in the top right corner the perspective view you can see the green one is the y-axis so we need to set this to y not z Okay, so let's go back to the script now and work on our start function. Now, at the moment, all we do is call the base class implementation of the start function. We want to leave that line in there. That's the first thing we should do because that's going to register this interactive object with our game scene manager's interactive object database. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to cast the base class reference to our collider as a box collider. So you can see I say box collider equals collider, which is a variable declared in the base class as box collider. And it's actually the base class version of the start function that actually does the get component call to get this collider reference. So we're just casting it to the correct type. Okay, so next up, let's check we have a valid box collider. And if so, we need to kind of cache things such as its extents, what its closed center point and closed extent should be, and what its open center point and open extent should be. So we'll start off by saying closed collider size equals open collider size equals a box collider dot size. In other words, initially we'll set the closed collider size and the open collider size vectors to just whatever the size of the box collider is at startup and of course at startup the door should be in the closed position so in the case of our demonstration earlier this should be the box collider centered about the door not being scaled in its forward direction and we'll do the same with the center point of the collider as well we'll set the closed collider center point and the open collider center point vectors to whatever the local position of the box collider is and i'm going to declare a local float called offset we're going to use this to temporarily store the amount that we 
wish to offset the center point of the collider when it's in its open position. Do that now. So the first thing we need to do is we need to, in order to calculate the open size and the open center point of the collider, we need to figure out in which dimension we wish to push it, which local axis, which remember we've just set to the Y axis for this particular door, but all of our door objects may have different local axes. So that's why we created that enumeration. So we're gonna now do a switch statement based on that enumeration so we can see what axis has been specified for us to push the collider along. So if the X axis is our local forward vector, then we need to create a plane that has our right vector as the plane normal. So you can see we do that by using Unity's plane class. We say new plane and we pass in as the normal of the plane, the right vector of our parent object. And we pass in the position as the point on that plane because you need a vector and a position to fully define a plane. So now that we have the plane defined, that means that we're gonna be able to determine whether we are on the front side or the back side of this door later on in our activate function when we're past the position of our character controller. And then what we need to do is we need to calculate what the size of the collider is gonna be. And we do that by simply assigning to the X component, because remember, if the X axis is the forward vector of this object, then it's only the X component of our collider that we wish to scale up. So we do that by saying open collider size dot X multiplied by collider length open scale, which of course is the value that we set via the inspector, which I think is set to three by default, isn't it? Yeah, we set to three by default. Yeah, there it is. Next up, we need to calculate the offset, how much we wish to move the closed collider. So that's easy. It's gonna be the closed collider's center point, which we've cached up here. And then we subtract from that the open collider's size dot X, that thing that we just calculated up above, divided by two. And so in other words, we're scaling it up and then we're moving it forward by half the amount we've scaled it up. So we're essentially kind of pushing the collider through the door so that the only bit that remains on our side of the door is is just the little fraction or the percentage of that collider that was on that side of the door before we opened it. Okay, so now we have that offset, we just need to set the open collider center point to a new vector, which has as its X component, that new offset, because we've slid the collider along the local X axis. And as the Y and Z components, well, they're just the same as the closed collider center points, Y and Z components. So we've now set up at this point, the open collider center and the open collider size. So let's now do exactly the same for if our game object is aligned such that its local Y axis is its perceived forward vector. So as you can imagine, we do pretty much the same, only this time we create the plane using the transforms position and the up vector instead of the right vector. Instead of setting the open collider's size's X component, we instead scale its Y component by the collider length open scale. And then we calculate the offset this time instead of using the X components of the collider center and the collider size Size, instead using the Y components of the collider center and the collider size. And once again, creating that new open collider center, making it basically the same as the closed collider center point, at least in the X and Z components, but as the Y component specifying that new offset along the Y axis that we just calculated. Finally, we need to do exactly the same for if the local Z axis is the perceived forward vector. So we create the plane, this time passing in the object's forward vector as the plane normal. And this time we need to scale the collider's Z Z component by our collider length open scale. And of course, to calculate the offset, we take the collider center dot Z and we subtract from that the open size dot Z divided by two. Once again, we're saying we want to push this collider half the extents at which we've grown it along that local perceived forward vector. And finally, we create the new open collider center point from that, just as we did in all of the other cases. So that's our plane created, so we can classify objects against this door to find out whether we're on the front or the back half space of that door. And we also know now how we need to change the collider, both its center and its size when it's closed and when it's open. Okay, so let's now determine if the door is supposed to start in an open state, because if it is, then we need to set the collider to the open collider size and the open collider center point rather than the closed collider center point and the closed collider size that it will currently be set to. So you can see if the door is not closed, then we set the size of our box collider to the open collider size and if we have chosen to offset the collider remember this is a boolean that we can tick via our inspector if this is unticked then we don't wish to offset the collider so we don't bother doing that but if we have chosen to offset the collider then we set the box collider center point to the open collider center point that we just calculated above Okay, so let's now loop through all of the doors that we have assigned to this object to manage and animate. 
So we set up a for each loop to, to loop through all of the interactive door info objects in this list. So inside this loop, we will say, assuming the door object isn't null, we has been assigned a valid reference, and we've also assigned it a valid transform, then we will set the doors to closed rotation to what the local rotation of the door currently is. Remember, it's assumed that all of the doors that rotate start off in their unrotated, their closed state. So we grab the current local rotation from the door and we cache that in our interactive door infos closed rotation member. We're also going to do the same with the position. We store in the closed position member of the interactive door info object the current position of the door. So now let's calculate the open position. This is something that we need to do in the case of it being a moving door. We set it to the current door position, but then we subtract that, the door movement vector. Now remember, the position of the door is in world space. So we need to take the axis of movement that we have specified in local space. So if we wanted to move it 10 down the z-axis, we would have specified that in the inspector as 0, 0, 10. And we need to transform that movement vector into world space. So to do that, we use the door transforms transform direction function that will transform that local axis vector into world space which we can then directly add on to the world space position of our door to generate the open door position so let's now calculate the rotation that we need the door to be at when it's open and to do that we need to create a quaternion that represents the axis and the rotation that we've specified via the inspector so if we wanted to rotate let's say 90 degrees around the y-axis in the inspector we would have specified this as 0 for x, 90 for y, and 0 for z. In 3D, we often use quaternions to describe rotations. So in order to take our axis and angle vector and convert it to a quaternion, we use the quaternion classes Euler function, passing in our local space door rotation vector, um, and that will return back a quaternion that represents that rotation. In other words, it's a quaternion that when multiplied with the door's current closed quaternion, Quaternion rotation will rotate it into the open position. So we now know how to open the door. We just need to multiply this quaternion with the door's current local rotation. So if is closed is not set to true, in other words, we wish this door to start in an open state, then we set the local rotation of the door to the closed rotation multiplied by that rotation to open quaternion that we just created. And that will rotate the door around the axis we've specified by the number of degrees that we've specified into its open position. And of course, if it's a sliding door, we also need to set the position of the door to its open position that we calculated up here. So that's the interactive doors in the list all set up either in their open or closed positions. And all of the information that they need to operate cached, such as their open and closed positions and their open and closed rotations. What we need to do now is turn off all of the colliders of the child mount. So you'll see that if we have assigned a transform to the contents mount, we will use Unity's get components in children function, passing in that we would like all colliders that are children of the contents mount returned to us in a collider array. And then we will loop through each collider and we'll just say that if the door is closed, we disable it. Otherwise, if the door is open, then we enable it. Finally, we will set our ionumerator coroutine variable to null because we're not currently running our animation coroutine. Okay, so underneath the start function, we'll work on our activate function, which remember needs to be overridden from the base class to provide bespoke functionality for this specific interactive item. It's, it needs to be a public function, of course, because it's gonna need to be called by our character manager, and it needs to also have the override function modifier because we're overriding it from the base class. The base class implementation does nothing, so we don't have to worry about calling the base class implementation. The activate function takes, as a single parameter, a character manager. So the first thing we need to do, just like we did in the get text function, is we need to make sure that if there are any states that need to be set in the application's game state dictionary, or if there are any inventory items that are required in order to activate this door, then we will do those checks now. So just as we did in the get text function, we will declare a local boolean called have required states that we will assume is true, and then we'll step into this conditional here that says if we have listed that there are some states that must be set in order for us to 
activate this door, first of all, we'll check we have a valid reference to an application manager instance. And if we don't, then we'll just assume that we don't have the required states and the door won't be able to be activated. Otherwise, we will call the application manager's rStateSet function, passing in the required states that we've specified via the inspector of this script, which will return either true or false, indicating whether we are allowed to activate this door. Now what we'll do is we'll step into the conditional case that is only executed if we have the required states and we have the required inventory item. Now remember the have required inventory items function is at the moment it's just a stub right it doesn't do anything it just always returns true. We're going to come back and fix that up in a few lessons time when we have the inventory system created. So for now if we have the required states we step into this conditional and the first thing we'll do is we'll say if our coroutine variable isn't null then it means that we have called activate while we are currently in the middle of a coroutine so we're either opening or closing the door and in the middle of doing that. So the first thing we need to do is stop that coroutine okay so we call the stop coroutine function passing in a reference to our coroutine. So now we need to assign to our coroutine variable the coroutine that we are about to invoke. And you'll notice that our coroutine that we're going to implement in a moment is also called activate. But this overload of the activate function is going to take as its parameter a boolean which describes whether we are opening it from the front or the back. And you can see in order to get that boolean we use our plain classes get side function. Remember we calculated the plane to use in our start function. The get side function simply takes a position in world space. So we just pass in the position of the character manager that we have passed into this function. And it will return true if we are on the front side of the plane and false if we are on the back side of the plane. Now, obviously, at the moment, we're getting this big red squiggle because this function doesn't yet exist. You can see that this version of the activate function is really just a wrapper around the activate coroutine function, which is going to be doing all of the heavy lifting. So you can see once we assign that coroutine to our coroutine variable, we then use Unity's start coroutine function to actually start the coroutine. And that is our activate function done. But of course, what we need to do now is we need to implement the activate coroutine function. Okay, so this coroutine is going to be a private member. It returns an I enumerator. It's called activate. Actually takes three parameters, even though we were only using one of them when we called it from the above activate function. The first parameter is a boolean that describes whether we are activating the door from its front side or from its backside. And we saw how we calculate that boolean here using the plain classes API. As the second parameter, this is set to false by default. This will be set to true if we are auto closing the door. In other words, it's been activated via an auto close. As the third parameter, which is set to zero by default, we also have an optional delay that we can specify. So it allows us to call the activate function past three seconds and tell the coroutine, I want you to close the door in three seconds. And in fact, we're going to use this with our auto closing doors. Remember I said earlier that we might want to have some doors that when you open, maybe 10, 15 seconds later, when you've walked away, it might go and creak shut. That's what that delay is going to be about. So the first thing we want to do is if a delay has has been specified we want to chew up that amount of time before we do anything so we yield return new wait for seconds passing in the delay which is the number of seconds we wish to wait before animating the door okay so once the delay has been chewed up if there was a delay we now need to set the default properties for the duration of the door animation and the time that we would like to start the animation from now now usually in a situation like this where we're animating something in a while loop inside a coroutine we normally make sure that time is zero uh, as we enter that while loop and it just keeps climbing up until the duration has been reached and by default I'm going to set the duration to 1.5 seconds but we are next week going to take the duration from the sound clip that has been specified to play and as we can specify an audio collection with lots of door opening and closing sounds if we wish that doesn't necessarily mean that the same door will animate over the same duration each time we open it it would depend on whatever sound is chosen from the audio collection that it's been assigned we're also going to assume that time starts at zero but you're going to see in a moment that we actually used our normalized time class variable to know where we really need to start the animation from in fact we'll do that now you can see that if normalized time is larger than zero now if a door is not currently in the process of being activated it will have a normalized time of zero so we know if normalized time is zero then we can just start the animation at time equals zero however if normalized time is not zero 
then that means that this coroutine has been called and a previous coroutine that may have only been halfway through was stopped. So if we'd been 75% of the way through opening that door, in other words, if normalized time was 0.75, then that means we're now closing the door in this invocation of the activate function, which means our normalized time needs to start at one minus normalized time, one minus 0.75 in our example. So we would start at normalized time equals 0.25 quarter of the way to being closed already. And that normalized time variable is how we get around the fact that we're using a kind of isolated coroutine to animate the door, but we can halt it at any time and start a new coroutine. The normalized time is the transport mechanism by which we sort of resume rotating the door back from where it ever got to in the last invocation of the coroutine. So the first thing we'll do is we'll handle the code for the case where if the door is currently closed, which means we're about to open it. So we set the is closed boolean to false. It's now considered from this point on an open door, even if it hasn't fully opened yet, we now consider it an opening door once it begins to open. Now, the next thing we need to do is that horrible switch statement and offset calculation again that we did in the start function. We need to figure out which is considered to be the local forward vector of our parent game object. Remember, that's the object with the interactive trigger on it. And we need to do that big case statement again to understand how we need to adjust the position of its collider. And I'm going to paste it all in because it's very similar to the one that we saw before. They're all duplicates of each other. Like this section here is working with the X component. This is working with the Y component. This is working in the Z component. So let me just examine the code for the case, like the door we've been currently messing around within our scene, where its perceived forward vector is actually its local Y axis. In this case, we calculate the offset at which we wish to move the collider as the open collider collider size dot y divided by two. In other words, half the collider's y dimension. And then what we say is, if we are not on the front side of the door, but then we don't wish to move the collider forward along the plane's vector. We actually wish to move it backwards along its normal vector. So you can see when that's the case, I set offset equal to minus offset. So I toggle a movement of say 10 units down the y-axis to minus 10 units down the y-axis. And then you can see I set the collider's center point accordingly. Okay, and we do that for the X and the Z as well, but feel free to pause the video now if you wish to examine it in a bit more detail. There's all the code there. Pause it now and examine it, but there shouldn't be anything here that you don't understand. Okay, so once we get outside of this switch statement, we've calculated what the new open collider center point should be. So now we need to figure out whether we actually need to apply that offset to the collider. So we first check that the offset collider boolean is set to true. Remember, that's a property that we set via the inspector indicating whether we wish the offset to the collider to be performed. And if it is, then we simply assign that new collider center point that we've calculated above to our box collider center point. And of course, we uh, set the open collider size to our box collider sizes vector as well. So at this point, We've opened the door. I mean, the door might not have even moved yet because we haven't begun animating it, but immediately we've set it as being an open door and we've adjusted its collider. We've, we've scaled it and we've offset it down what we consider to be the local forward axis of the parent object of the door. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is we want to calculate the time that we should start animating this door from. But that's easy. We already have the normalized time, which in the case where no previous coroutine was running will be zero. So duration times zero will be zero. But in the case where the door may have been, let's say, halfway through being open, or, or closed, sorry, in this case, and we've toggled to open it again while it was halfway closed, but the normalized time would be 0.5 if we imagine that we're using the default of three seconds as the duration at which we wish to animate our door, but then the time that we start animating from will actually be three times 0.5. So we will actually start counting up from 1.5 seconds into the animation. Okay, so let's create that while loop that says, keep iterating while our time is smaller or equal to our duration. So inside the while loop, the first thing we'll do is we will loop through every one of our interactive door infos. Remember, this is the, the door structures that we're managing. And assuming we have a valid reference to a door info object, and we have a valid transform stored in that interactive door info object, then the first thing we'll do is we'll calculate the normalized time as being time over duration. Now we need to calculate the position of the door. Now that's quite easy in the case where we're moving the door. We simply set its new position and we do a vector three look 
cooler between the closed position of the door, which we've already stored, and the open position of the door, which we also already calculated and stored in the start function of this script. And we look between them using the normalized time as the T value. And that's why this works, because even if we executed this coroutine and we'd been halfway through a previous coroutine, with a normalized time will immediately be 0 0.5 in the first iteration of this loop. In the very first iteration of this loop, the door will be halfway between the closed position and the opening position, and then we'll continue as this loop executes and normalized time is updated. Let's now calculate the new rotation of our object using a kind of similar technique. So we set the local rotation of our door equal to what the closed rotation of the door is, which remember we recorded and stored in our start function, because remember the closed rotation of the door is really just the local rotation of the door at scene startup, because we assume that all doors are in their closed positions and rotations. And then what we need to do is calculate a quaternion that we can multiply with the closed rotation to take it to the open rotation, which we kind of did in the start function, but we we have to do this again now because we have to figure out based on which side of the door we're on, which side of that plane we're on, which direction we wish to rotate it in. So you can see I multiply with the closed rotation a quaternion created from saying quaternion Euler. Basically say if we are on the front side of the plane or this isn't a two-way door, in which case we treat a door that isn't a two-way door as always it opening up as if we're on the front side. Well then we simply pass in our local rotation vector. Remember this is a 3D vector that specifies not only the local axis to use, but also the amount to rotate around that axis, multiplied by our normalized time. So if it was, let's say, 0, 90, 0, specifying a 90 degree rotation around the local Y axis, and normalized time was currently 0 0.5, then what we would be creating in this iteration of the loop is a quaternion that when multiplied with our closed rotation, will rotate the door only 45 degrees halfway between those rotations. And you can see I use this comparison pressed if else syntax here. If we're on the front side of the plane or it's a two-way door, then we use the door rotations multiplied by nor normalized time. Otherwise, we actually negate the door rotation. So 90 degrees in the Y component would become minus 90 degrees. Once again, scaling by normalized time. So that line there takes care of saying if we're in front of the plane, rotate it one way. Otherwise, rotate it in the opposite direction. Then we will make sure that we yield return null, very important, otherwise everything else in our game will not get a chance to be processed. And then underneath the yield return null, so when we come back and execute this on the next frame, we will add on to the current time, time dot delta time. And of course this loop will continue to execute until time has exceeded the duration, and then we will exit this while loop and our animation will be done. Now when that's the case, what we need to do is we need to say if we have assigned a valid transform to our contents mount, then we need to fetch all of the colliders from that contents mount, doing what we did in the start function using the content mounts transforms get components in children's function saying give us all of the colliders that are on all the game objects that are children of you. And then we will loop through all of those colliders and we will enable them. Remember, we're opening the door. So at this point, the door is opened up fully and we wish to turn on the colliders of any objects that are inside a cabinet or inside a drawer. Finally, as the animation is over, we will set normalized time back to zero so that the next time we activate a coroutine, it will know that we're not interrupting this coroutine. And then what we need to do in the case where we're opening the door is we need to say if we have have ticked the auto close boolean in the inspector, then it means that we wish this door, although we've just opened it, we, we wish it to automatically close after a random number of seconds. So if auto close is set to true, we assign to our coroutine variable, our activate coroutine function, this time passing in once again, which side of the door we're on, we pass true as a second parameter indicating that this is being automatically closed. Um, and there's the third parameter, we pass the number of seconds that we would like the coroutine to wait once it's called before it starts animating the door. And to do that, we use the random classes range function, passing in a random number of seconds between the minimum seconds, which is in the auto close delay vectors X component, and the maximum number of seconds that is stored in the Y component of the auto close delay vector. Of course, all we've done at this point is assign the coroutine to our coroutine variable. We also need to activate it by using Unity start coroutine function, and then we need to yield break. 
Okay, so that has totally handled the case where we are opening the door from a closed state. Now we need to do kind of similar stuff again in the case where we the door is open and we now wish to close it, which is where this else clause will be executed. If the door is currently open, then we're going to close it. So the first thing we do is we set is closed to true. We then loop through each of the doors that we're managing. And assuming we have a valid door object and the door object has been assigned a valid transform, what we're going to do is we're going to cache what the current open rotation of the door is. We're going to store it in the door's open rotation variable, just temporarily. We're about to close the door is if we have a valid reference to a transform for the contents mount, we will once again fetch all of the colliders that are children of the contents mount. We will loop through each one and we will disable the colliders so that as the door is closing, we can no longer pull any objects out of a cabinet or a cupboard or a drawer. Next up, we will set time to duration times normalized time like we've done above. And then we will start the while loop to uh, to close the door from its current open position. So inside the loop, we will iterate through each of our interactive door object. Assuming we have a valid interactive door info object and it's been assigned a valid transform, we will calculate the new normalized time as being time over duration. And what we'll do is we'll do a vector three lerp, much as we did before, but instead of lerping from the closed position to the open position using normalized time, we will lerp from the open position to the closed position using our normalized time. Rotation is going to be slightly simpler in the case where we're closing the door. We're simply going to assign to our local rotation a lerp between the door open rotation, the door closed rotation using normalized time. Okay, so outside of processing all of the doors in the while loop, for each iteration of that while loop, we yield return null, and then we update our time with time dot delta time. Now, once we leave this while loop, it means that the door has been closed, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to iterate through each of our doors again, and inside it, we're going to make sure that the local rotation of the door is actually set specifically to that closed rotation that it was at startup. And we're also going to do the same with the position. We're going to make sure that we snap the door to the closed position so we don't get any rounding errors creeping in over time. And we end up an hour into the game with doors that don't seem to actually rotate all the way closed. Uh, finally, we then update the box collider's size and center point by assigning back to it the closed collider size and the closed collider center point that we cached in the start function. And then we fall out of that else clause and we just set normalized time back to zero. We set the coroutine to null and then we yield break. Our activate coroutine is over. At least for now, we're going to add a load more code to it in the next lesson. Okay, so we have just one more small function to write and then we are done for this lesson. So I'm gonna scroll down to underneath the closing brace of our activate coroutine function and I'm gonna create a new function that returns void and it's called on trigger enter. Now we know this is one of Unity's magic functions. Unity will call this function automatically when any collider that is configured to collide with the interactive layer enters our trigger. So this is gonna be used to automatically open doors. So like I said, if you imagine in our game, if you look at these double doors, in this particular case, rather than having a tight hugging trigger like we have here on the door, what we'd have is a, is a really big one, which maybe extends in some way uh, down both sides of the corridor. So as we enter it about here, the door would begin to activate. Let's write this function. It's gonna be all stuff that we've seen already. So the first thing we're gonna do is in the first line, we're gonna say that if this object has not been configured to do automatic opening, then we're gonna return. Or if the door is open already, then also don't do anything, just return, right? We don't wanna automatically open a door that's either already opening or already open. So if any of those are true, we just return. So next up, we need to make sure that all the required states and inventory items are set to activate this door, even in the automatic open case. So just as we've done in all the other functions, we'll create a Boolean called have required states, we'll set it to true by default, and, and then we'll do the tests to see if it's false. So we'll say, if we have specified some states via the inspector, then first of all, if we don't find an application manager instance, then we just assume that have required states is false and the door will not open. Otherwise, we will assign to the have required states Boolean the return of a call to the application manager manager's are states set function passing in the required states. 
Then underneath that, we'll say, assuming we have the required state set and we have the required inventory items, well, then if a coroutine is currently running, we'll stop it. We'll call the coroutine and we'll just pass in the side of the plane that we're on. So you can see we use our planes get side function, this time passing in the position of the collider we've been passed. So if you imagine this is our character controller here, we're just passing in the position of our character as classified against our plane. And then we start the coroutine. And that, I believe, is our interactive door class done for this lesson. So let's save everything off. Okay, so let's test this puppy now. Let's see sort of if this collider is the right size and all that sort of stuff. So let us find our FPS control. Actually, let's go down into that room right by that door. And let's select our FPS controller. And so we don't have to keep falling through the hole each time. Let's move it down here so we sort of start off right in front of the door. Rotate it around. So I even start off looking at the door. I don't even want to have to turn around. There you go. So I can walk straight forward when I press play and check this works. Now, of course, nothing is going to work at the moment because we haven't configured our door. We haven't even told it which child door object it's supposed to rotate. So let's now set up our interactive door script. Now, for the time being, we will leave the messages that are sent to the HUD as they are. But I do actually think that in Dead Earth, I'm not actually going to use any hint text on traditional doors like this this. I think I'm just going to use this for when we're using it on cabinet doors and drawers in desks and things like that and filing cabinets. I don't want it on the actual doors. So, but for now, I'm going to leave that intact. And what I need to do is I need to open up this door structure here. And this object ha only has one child door that it wants to manage. So I'm going to put one in the list. And this is going to create one interactive door info object for me to uh, set up. So you can see, I first of all need to assign the transform of the child door here. So let's drag over that door seven object and assign it there. And what I want to do is I want to rotate the door around its local. Let me select the door. You can see it's its local Z axis. And I want to rotate it, I think, 90 degrees, right? I'm going to put 90 degrees in the Z, okay, because I want to rotate it 90 degrees around its local Z axis. Now, it's very important that you remember when you're clicking on these doors and you're trying to figure out which axis to rotate around that you have this button set to local, not global. Otherwise, you'll be thinking you've got to rotate it around the Y axis here. And it's not. It's the local axis we're interested in, which is the Z axis. OK, and what we'll do just to test it, I won't maximize on play, but I'll also check that if we untick the is closed property, then this door should start in an open position. Let's see if it does. Look at the scene view. Hey, look at that. It did indeed. And you can see it's correctly offset and moved our collider so that we've got that kind of dead zone in front of the door where it would close on us if we allowed them to close the door here. So let's actually see if we can now close the door in the game view. So if we walk up to the door, I'm getting nothing. Oh, I'm getting a null reference exception. What's that? What haven't I done here? Ouch, character manager. Well, that's weird. It's actually a call to the game scene managers get interactive item function that is obviously returning null as our interactive item. I did remember to derive our interactive door, didn't I, from interactive item. That's weird. I definitely remember to... I put game scene manager in the scene, didn't I? Yeah, there it is. Oh, okay. This is what I did. What a nutsack. Look, I created a game object called game scene manager. But I actually didn't add the game scene manager script to it. What a complete deal. Okay, let's add the game scene manager to it. Don't worry about blood particles. We'll uh, we'll leave that null for now. And this this puppy should work now. So when I walk up to the door, hey look, it's saying press use to open. Now when I press E here, I am hoping that the door opens outwards. Wow, it's a shitty open animation because it's set to one and a half seconds which is too much but you can see now the HUD has closed or changed sorry to say press the use button to close and there we go so that works so now while I'm stood right in the path of the door you can see it won't let me use it and then as I step away it will let me close the door again and if I walk up and open that look at that works like a charm and what I also want to check is that if I interrupt the coroutine when, let's say, it's in the middle of uh, closing, and then I try and open it again, that it doesn't sort of jump or anything crappy like that. So here we go. I'll press it. Look at that. Works like a charm. I can interrupt the coroutine and everything. 
Perfect. Okay, so why don't we try the auto close? So I don't think I've got this door set to auto close at the moment. So let's see if auto close works. Remember the, the actual speed of the animation will be dependent on whichever sound file we end up giving to it. So I am going to click auto close and for now, I'll leave the auto close delay at exactly five seconds. I've done that by setting five seconds as the minimum time and five seconds as the maximum time. So if you imagine, right, imagine I, um, imagine I close this door again, right? Imagine I open up some sort of office and I'm having a look around. And then while I'm in here, I'm looking over here. I forget I opened that door and then I hear, bosh, and the door closes behind me. Okay, so auto close works as well. So I suppose we should try auto open as well. Shouldn't we just double check that works? Um, so for an auto open door, what we would want to do is we wouldn't want to have any collider scale, right? We wouldn't want to scale the collider. We also wouldn't want to offset the collider. But what we probably would want to do is make the collider much bigger. Now, of course, because um, this has the y-axis, the local y-axis, as its perceived forward vector. That is the direction that I wish to scale this oh, collider. I moved it at the center point, so I, I meant to move its extent. So let's say we had something like that. In fact, we could even make this a bit wider, couldn't we, for an auto test? Remember, I'm not worrying about this being exact at the moment. I'm just testing what we've done so far. We're going to set up all the doors correctly in the next lesson. So. If I walk forward, actually, I probably started off inside the trigger, so. Oh, an idiot. Look, I forgot to actually tick the auto open box. Okay, let's try now. Let me just check I start outside of the trigger. Okay. Walk up to the door. Ah, I think I know what the problem might be. Um, we, I don't think we ever made the interactive layer sort of collidable with anything. So if we go to the edit menu, call up the project settings and then select the physics. I look, there you go. Our interactive layer, because we've only ever used it for ray casting before now, it needs to collide or be sensitive to triggering by the player layer. So let's tick that little tick box in there. So the player now collides with the interactive layer. And I'm really hoping that that's, uh, that's going to solve the problem. Let's see. So let me uh, full screen this. The maximum effect. <laughs> what I've done is I hadn't the is trigger box set. Now I know I have on the prefab, so that's really weird. I obviously accidentally unticked that just now. Okay, let's try now. Got to be a trigger or otherwise we'll never be able to get inside the zone that auto opens it. Okay, if this doesn't work now, I'm going to hang myself. Hey, look at that. So we'll wait for the, uh, actually I'm going to have to, I turned off auto close. So I'm going to have to, uh, <laughs> see this is, this is why you wouldn't really have an automatic door and a manual closing door in this way because the trigger is now massive so I'd have to sort of stand back here in order to uh, activate it but in the case of doors like this this big trigger would be good because you wouldn't want to activate it anyway you would have automatic opening and automatic closing but just to test this let me take that again and then as I walk up to the door even from the side as I enter the trigger it should open up and it opens up the right way as I would expect and just to double check one last time, let's put auto close and auto open on. So I can walk up. I can walk away. This is how you would sort of configure a normal automatic door, right? You'd walk away, it would auto close. Then as you walked up to it again, it would auto open. Okay, perfect. Let me uh, wind back the size of that collider. Okay, so I'm going to set this door back to its default state, which is it is going to auto close. I'm going to have it auto close somewhere between like five and 20 seconds. Actually, no, I'm going to leave it at five for now because in the next lesson, we're going to add the sound effects and I don't want to have to wait 20 seconds to uh, see the door close and hear the sound effect. 
Uh, we're not going to auto open. It is going to be a two-way door. Actually, let me just check that if it's not a two-way door, it does always open up the correct way. So from this place here where I'm behind the door, it should actually open up into me. Didn't expect that. Oh, what have I done? I've, I've unticked the wrong thing again. I'm supposed to untick the is two-way. That's the thing I'm supposed to untick. Okay, so now it should open up into me, right? There you go. So it's not doing that multi-door thing now. It will always open up inwards. Cool. Let me also remember to offset the collider again and put collider length scale back to three. Cool. Okay, so I think for this lesson we're done. Now I know at the moment it doesn't feel particularly great what we've just spent quite a long time creating, but trust me, it is fabulous. At the end of the next lesson, when you have all of these doors opening and closing, sync to sounds, it's actually going to start to feel like an actual game world. It's amazing the difference just adding opening and closing door sounds makes and being able to sort of walk up to every cupboard and every drawer and slide it open. So thanks for listening, guys. I'm sorry I've been a little bit bunged up. I'll be honest with you, I've got a massive case of the man flu today. I'm practically dying while I'm doing this. But uh, thanks for listening. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.